It's a thing now. If I could read your paper, I, I wasn't, some of, some of the stuff, it was a little tough. No, it's, no, it's fine. It, it's tough to scan. to actually do one more thing that I forgot. Who is though? So, all yeah, right, so. I don't know. Yeah. And Wednesday and Friday. Pull that back up in a second. Finbong and Aaron will show up here in a few seconds or a few minutes. So Finbong will come running in. So. <coughs> okay, we're we're, we're going to finish up chapter six. Uh, we still have chapter seven. I plan to cover chapter seven. We're, we're on track to actually finish that this semester. And we've got two weeks of counting today, two weeks of lecture. So I think uh, assuming we don't go online and lose time, uh, we'll be able to finish up chapter seven, which is on modulated digital. But there's kind of a few just uh, random topics, not really random, but some one topic on, um, I, want to, I want to talk briefly about baseband MRI, and then, and then also um, talk about uh, a topic known as eye diagrams, which is a diagnostic tool. Okay. And then uh, talk a little bit about adaptive filters, but not enough to really do much with but with M, so we've been thinking primarily about the binary case and plus minus pulses, but with M amplitude levels, we can encode N bits, per pulse or symbol. Okay. So for example, I'm going to show what's called a uh, four area. 
with gray encoding. And so what I'll have here are actually, I'll just show four different amplitude levels. Okay. And I'm going to encode them as each amplitude level would represent two bits. Okay. And then, so let's say I've got the, the sequence here, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, and one, well, let me draw it out like this. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Okay. But now before we produce a pulse, we actually re uh, read uh, two adjacent bits. One zero is up at the top, and then finally one one. Okay, so this this would be the zero one, zero zero, one zero, and one one. Actually, I probably should have had my my zero zero level down there at at zero. Let me let me cheat. It doesn't matter. Just four different amplitude levels, but. You'd probably let one of them be zero. They could be positive or negative as well. Okay. But the the idea here is now that I actually um, each pulse, when I transmit a single pulse, I'm actually getting two bits of information. Okay. So the advantage here is that these pulses are much wider than they would be if I were encoding each individual bit. Okay. And since the bandwidth is I mean, what are you doing? You can put your computer away, please. Um, the, the idea is that you, you would encode uh, two bits here. So your, your, bits would, your pulse width would be twice as long, okay. which means that you need half the transmission bandwidth as for a single pulse. Okay. Um, so that would be the advantage. I, with eight ARI, I could get pulses three times as long, each pulse would actually represent three bits. Okay. And so the, if you're constrained by bandwidth, for example, uh, by using M area encoding, I could get an kind of an arbitrary number, uh, an arbitrary binary rate, because my bandwidth really constrains my pulse width. It doesn't put constraints on the amplitude of the pulse. Okay. There are other uh, constraints, other reasons not to use MRI, but this is a common, here I'm showing amplitude levels, but when we do modulation, it might be four different phase angles, okay, or four different frequencies, or eight different frequencies. Now, there have been some schemes where they, they've used a combination of amplitudes and phase angles to encode in a single pulse, an entire byte of information, eight bits. Now that requires 264 different um, levels, right? Uh, amplitude and or, and or phase. Um, so it is common with high, desired high uh, bit rates. Now the other thing that you may hear is what's called the, the baud rate. Often people equate that with the, the number of bits per second. The baud rate is actually the symbol rate. So it's not quite the same. The, the, the symbol rate here is, is actually going to be, um, I've got one symbol for two bits. So the binary rate is gonna be twice the symbol rate or the symbol rate's gonna be half the binary rate with four area encoding. Uh, the symbol or, or baud rate, R is equal to one over T. This would be, so T is my symbol duration. Um, this would be symbols per second or baud. The binary rate 
in this case would be RB or log 2M over T bits per second or log 2M times the, times the baud rate. Okay. So the minimum pulse width is determined by the channel bandwidth. So let's look at let's look at an example. So assume a channel bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. Okay. Then compare bit rates for binary and eight airy if raised cosine pulses are used with alpha equal to one. Okay. So the the baud rate is determined by uh, the bandwidth. Our approximation has been that that the 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 bandwidth and the pulse width are inversely proportional. Okay, and that's true if you're using raised cosine pulses. with an alpha equal to one, okay. And again, what we've been assuming all semester is if, you know, the bandwidth is 10 kilohertz, the maximum pulse rate would be uh, 10 kilohertz or 10 uh, kilo symbols per second now because I'm encoding multiple bits in a symbol, okay. So the bandwidth actually determines my, my, my pulse width. Now for the rose, raised cosine pulses with an alpha equals zero, that's the sync pulse case. We can actually get a higher, bind, we can actually get a higher uh, pulse rate of twice that in this, in this case. But again, if you're not giving in any information, this is a good assumption. Just assume that your pulse width and the, and the bandwidth of your channel are inversely proportional. Um, but the binary rate is equal to the baud rate if you're doing binary encoding, m equal two, okay. But if you're doing eight level encoding, log two of eight, log two of the number of levels is no, nothing more than the number of bits that it takes to represent that number of levels. So it takes, um, takes eight levels to represent three bits. So you get three times the, this binary rate or, or 30 kilobits per second for M equal to eight. Okay. Okay. So why not always use M -ary? So a couple couple things. It's um, it's harder to detect between the different levels correctly. The more levels I have, so my error rate actually will typically go up when I'm using M area encoding because with binary I just have to make a decision between two levels. Now, I've, in order to make a correct decision, I've got to make a decision between four different levels. Um, to maintain the same bit error rate, I have to increase my power. I have to make sure that these four levels are much further apart than, than the corresponding binary levels would be. Now, so to attain the same error rate, I 
the transmitted power must be increased by m squared over log two of m for this eight area case. This is a factor of 64 divided by three or a 21 times increase for M area over binary in terms of transmitted power. And we haven't actually talked about binary error rate, error rate. here we have to talk about noise first, but this, so this comes from an, uh, a binary error rate analysis of binary versus M area. So you guys may barely remember using phone modems for the internet. Does anyone ever remember using a modem to connect to the internet over phone lines? A few of you may have. Um, so, you know, when the internet first became available in the ho in home, you actually used, uh, you received binary data over your analog phone line. Okay, it was, it was translated into a, a series of different frequencies, audio frequencies. Um, so it wasn't transmitted digitally. But the, but the problem was, you know, the, the traditional analog phone line was only has a bandwidth of like 3,500 Hertz. Okay. So you'd be limited to bit rates essentially of, you know, 3,000 bits per second. It, that's not good streaming video quality. It's, it's actually slow internet, you know, internet uh, web pages take forever to load even, you know, images or, so th they did a number of different things to uh, get much higher bit rates with that 3.5 kilohertz restriction on landlines. Um, um, they came out with a, a number of different modem protocols. Most of them involve though some sort of form of MRE signaling and also encoding of the data. So the, the highest speed modems that you could get that worked over an analog phone line, they got up to, they got up to, to bit rates of, I want to say um, around 50 kilobits per second. So still really slow compared to today's standards. But to do that, they, they had to keep increasing the power. The, um, there's ultimately a, a limit on, uh, on the phone lines on how much power they could put on any one line because they're bundled in cables. And if the power on one line was got to be too great, you would actually get crosstalk. So another phone cable that's in the bundle would actually pick up the data from uh, you know a num another telephone pair that was in the bundle. So in order to prevent crosstalk, they limited the amount of power that could be transmitted on any one telephone line pair. But this was kind of, you know, the, the ultimate they were able to get to through the traditional landline of about 50 kilobits per second using, using the last modems that were produced, okay. Uh, then the telephone company came out with uh, uh, what they called DSL, digital subscriber line, which they, they typically had to come out then and, and condition your telephone line or you had to be close enough to the exchange in order to get DSL. Um, um, that, was, that was a completely different, that was a dig, they were sending digital, t digital signals over your telephone line, but it had, your telephone line had to be conditioned to have a wider bandwidth in order to support DSL. And, and that still used a lot of the same techniques that some of the, the, the photom, that the modems did. With DSL, I think the DSL rates were able to get up into the, I wanna say maybe six megabits per second or something like that. Um, you know, enough to actually have uh, streaming quality video and the megabits per second with, with DSL. Um, most people now actually, um, and, uh, uh, I don't know, does anyone have DSL at home? I had it for a while, for a few years. Most people now get their 
internet through uh, cable company. Um, what other options are there? There's some wireless options too that actually uh, pretty high speed. Satellite, does anyone have satellite internet? There's some problems with satellite internet on, works pretty well for streaming video. I mean, the, the, the binary rate's there, but it's not responsive because the signal has to propagate to the satellite and then back. So, you know, when you click on a, on a link, there's a, a long delay before, before you see the, the, the next web page or something like that. So a lot of people with satellite internet complain about the, the latency or that delay but if you're streaming a video, you know, it's, it's delayed by a second, but you don't really care once, once, the, once the video starts streaming. Um, but most people have gone to uh, um, cable, which provides, you know, hundreds of megabits per, per second uh, for, your, for your internet. So we will see this again though, you know, uh, and this, this idea of, of cramming more bits into a given bandwidth. That's, that's always the goal. And this will pop up again when we look at modulated digital. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but we, I think we will still see this again, um, where, where they actually will use different, different frequencies, you know, four different frequencies, same idea, um, or, you know, eight different frequencies. Um, Bless you. Um, next topic is, is actually a, a diagnostic tool. So a, a field engineer uh, can use an oscilloscope to check the quality of a transmission line. So consider transmitting a zero ISI pulse. And of course, one, one way to do that is, is actually to, uh, um, you know, make sure your pulses are narrower than, than your, your bit interval. But we, we talked about some other techniques. You know, one is as long as it crosses zero a bit interval away, you can still have zero inter symbol interference between your, between your pulses and relax bandwidth requirements. So here I've, here I've made it 2 TB in, in width, even though I'm going to transmit a pulse every TB seconds. Okay, so kind of what this would look like. Let's say I've got one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. So I've got a one here. I'm gonna center it over my tick marks actually. So I would transmit this. For the zero, I'm gonna use a, a form of polar signaling here. The one would be here. Uh, just make sure. So the one would be there. This one would be here. The zero would be here, the zero be here, the one, the zero, the one. Those are the individual pulses, but because they're longer than a bit interval, you know, I get the, my waveform that's transmitted is actually the sum of all these. So it starts out like this. Here, these are zeros, so I've got to get to this point. So it does that. Then here, I've got to get to this point, does that. You know, here it'll do something like that with two consecutive ones. Here a zero, so it's gonna do like this. Another zero, then a one, one, zero, 
one, you know, the waveform is going to look something like this. Okay. And again, by I can pull out the binary data here because this pulse has zero. You know, that's a one here. TB away. That's a zero. One, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Although it's a, a highly distorted waveform, it doesn't look like you know my individual pulses. This is what I would get, you know, if my pulses are longer than a bit interval. And again, we've talked about how, you know, due to convolution over the channel and receive and transmit fil filters, my, my pulses get wider through transmission. Okay. Now, if I can think about looking at a, an individual pulse here as it crosses zero in, in a TB interval, and what I, what I see on an oscilloscope are, you know, if I see, if I have an individual one, you know, or this would be a zero, one, zero, I guess. I'm gonna see, do I have, yeah, zero, one, zero, I'm gonna see this pulse, you know, that looks like this would be a zero, one, zero. I'll see something like that. For a one, zero, one, I'll see something like this. You know, it goes down to zero, okay. For, you know, one followed by a zero, I'm gonna do this. For a zero followed by a one, I'm gonna do that. You know, for a one, 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 I'll have this. You know, for a zero, uh, for a one followed by a zero, I'll have this. For a zero followed by a one, I'll have that. For a zero, 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 I'll have that. Okay, so the, <laughs> the idea here is I, I'm picking up, this is on my oscilloscope, one bit interval wide, okay. and I'm triggering my oscilloscope with an exter external clock, so it's re-triggering every TV. Then on my oscilloscope, remember, it just keeps showing me these traces over and over and over again, right, as I re-trigger. And so what I would see on my oscilloscope is something that looks like this, hopefully. And that depends a lot on, depends a lot on the, the type of pulse that I'm actually transmitting. And this is certainly without noise, you know, with noise present, these things, depending on the, the amount of noise, you know, get you know, pretty fuzzy as it, as on my oscilloscope, it's traced over and over again, um, you know, noise all over the place on, on all of this, okay. Now this is called an eye pattern or an eye diagram. Okay. And it's just repeated scope traces, triggered at TB, okay. Now, there's some diagnostic information. So, uh, I'm gonna have to pull that down. I just can't bend down that low. Now I'll never get it up, so. All right, so, th so this is for that waveform showing the kind of the corresponding eye, di eye diagram here. Some information you can get out of an eye diagram, a diagnostic information. You know, this is, you know, one with, it's not gonna look like this, but it would be much fuzzier. Uh, you, you'd want to sample, when the eye is, it's called an eye diagram because it kind of looks like an eye, right? Um, it's called an eye, um, you'd, you can get sampling information. You want to sample when the eye is at its widest. Okay, So that's at this interval. Um, you can also get, you know, from here, in this particular case, this would be your threshold. So, uh, you know, anything that's above this 
middle level, middle level you'd classify, you'd say as a one, anything below that you'd say is a zero. But you can also see here based on the, on the width of this, how much noise is present as well. And so they, they talk about, you know, um, this is being the, the, uh, the particular margin over noise. This is, there's some fuzz here, instead of getting a, a well-defined zero crossing without noise, you know, it's a fuzzy level here. Um, again, the, the noise is broadening out all of these different, out all of these different signals. But this is a pretty good, you know, a field technician would look at this and say, oh, this is pretty good. This is a pretty good eye diagram. It's, it's when the eye is closed okay, due to a lot of noise being present, or typically it might indicate, you know, for some reason you've only seen maybe this, this upper portion. It indicates that something's gone wrong in your transmitter or in your receive line that you're not getting the negative pulses. So it's a troubleshooting technique that can be used by a field technician to determine, you know, roughly um, qualitatively how good the transmission should be, you know, with, so with a portable oscilloscope, they might hook this up and look at a digital data line. So a wide open eye indicates low amount of inner symbol interference, but a, a more closed eye would be um, a more inner symbol interference. You get, for m -ary diagrams, these things become much more complex. I think this is showing you know, four different pulse amplitudes. Uh, no, this is for two, but it's showing it over two intervals. So the eye diagram would typically just be that portion, you know, what I've drawn there. But then with uh, M equal two, and then this is four different levels. Again, the eye diagram would just be here and you can see your four different levels that are present um, for, and this is M equal two and M equal four, I guess with additional, um, with a lower bandwidth channel actually compared to this one. Okay. Okay, the last thing I'm going to mention on the last topic in this chapter, and, and this would be if you took a graduate course in communications, you might talk about equalization or adaptive filtering. We said that our received pulse spectrum was our transmitted pulse spectrum times our uh, channel response times our receive filter response. Okay. Remember G of F is responsible for generating our, our pulse shape or our pulse sh sh shaping filter. Or we also talked about, you know, how this is typically might be a, a raised cosine. We, we want P of F to have this particular shape, you know, this raised cosine shape or this sink shape. But the problem, and you know, we've got some freedom over selecting G of F and Q of F, but the problem is our, our channel response is often unknown. H of F may be unknown. It may actually vary with time. So a solution is use an adjustable filter for Q of F. And one easy way to implement an adjustable filter is with what's called a transversal equalizer. It's also called a tap delay line or often just a, a TDL equalizer. Um, it's based on actually sampling the received signal and 
multiplying it by various coefficients. It's really just filtering. This is W of minus, what have we got here? N, W of minus N plus one. And then all of these go into a summer. And it might be an arbitrary number of taps here to produce the output. So so y of t then would actually be what I want for my equalizer here um it would be then my g of t convolved with h of t convolved with my Q of T, what I want for my uh, Q of my Q of T impulse response for my equalizer as a tap delay line, it's going to be the sum from minus N to N of the weights times just a delayed impulse, right? For my impulse response, I let the, the signal be an impulse and so the response of this is the impulse delayed each times a different weight, just all added together. Okay. And I want my P of T to be equal to G of T convolved with H of T involved with H E Q of T, or I, let me call the convolution of these two C of T. Q, Q, E, Q of T. Okay. Or plugging this in, I get the sum from K equal minus, minus N to N of W of K C T minus KT. Okay. So my C signal is, is really the signal coming in off of my line. It's actually, you know, it'd be the ideal impulse response of these two filters. Okay, so the noise-free version. So I, I can't really access the noise-free version of that. But for zero symbol interference, What I want is this thing ideally at intervals of my sampling time, it should be equal to my pulse energy at I equal to zero and then zero everywhere else. I mean, that was the condition for, um, um, for zero intersymbol interference, you know, it was okay to have a a pulse that was wider than a, you know, even the, the, a single pulse, but it had to have zero crossings at all my other pulse in, instances. Okay, so um, so typically you you can represent this as a matrix equation, okay, and you can actually solve then for for the optimal weights um, from the matrix uh, uh, equation. So uh, how, do you, how do you find the, the samples for your CI? You typically transmits what, what's known as a training sequence over the line, a given set, a known symbol bit pattern. Okay. And then you know what you're going to get at the receiver. And then you can adapt the weights or change the weights until you get optimum decisions at the receiver. So again, this, this is an area of, I'm not gonna say really any more about it, 
might see more of this in graduate school. Um, if you study adaptive filtering. Okay. That's all I have today. If, if you came in late though, I have your home, I have your exams, so. Thank you.